This conference will now be recorded. Oh, Jay, this is uh, Randy and Chow Myers and we're here. But Chow Black. Chow uh, Black. Carol right. so. Black. I'm going to mute now. Okay. Yeah, if everybody would mute, that'd be great. All right, well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining. My name is Jay Berkowitz, and I'm pleased to have my friend Jeff Sabar with me. And Jeff is a real expert in working from home. Um, some of us have been doing it for three or four days. Jeff's been doing it for 31 years. So Jeff, thank you very much for being here. And um, Thanks for having me. actually, I've, I've got a little intro slide for you. And then Jeff, if you don't mind, you can intro me. Um, so Jeff is the chief home officer and he's had that, how long have you had that brand, Jeff? Uh, since probably around 95, 96, uh, when I started really seeing the, the home office trend, not take off, but really catch some some momentum. And so uh, created a brand around it and got involved in helping people with uh, home officing. That's really awesome. And um, Jeff helps companies figure out, he, for years he's been helping companies figure out how to work from home. So today it's apropos to have such an expert um, and he helps individuals. So we're gonna do sort of two kinds of uh, messaging today. One, how to help companies get online and figure out how to access um, your business remotely and generate business remotely. And two, how individuals set up their workspace and work from home. Um, so, uh, and, and Jeff, one of the things, amazing things that he said is he's raised three kids working from home uh, and been doing this for 31 years. So it's really, really awesome. So Jeff, thanks you. Thank you again for being here. Thank you for having me. And um, what you could talk a little bit about me? Sure. Um, again, Jay, thanks for having me. Jay and I go back. Um, I'm a I'm a freelance writer and a, a business uh, journalist and columnist. And I met Jay 20 or so years ago, even before 10 Golden Rules had launched. And yeah. I was doing a marketing column for some of the media down here and for Advertising Age magazine. We got hooked up that way. And then Jay launched 10 Golden Rules at really not the infancy, but soon thereafter of, of online marketing and how the, the seemed the, the convergence of online and traditional marketing and how people can build their brands. And uh, Jay and I hit it off and got to know one another. And I wrote a lot about his his brand and, and saw him grow that and grow his speaking. And so it's um it, it's been a fun rise and I'm, and I appreciate you reaching out. It was Jay who reached out to me when uh, the coronavirus uh, you know sort of necessitated uh, what some out there <coughs> are calling social distancing, what our friend Bruce Turkel now calls physical distancing because she not should not be sacrificing the social component because we can do it online and through you know electronic digital social means. 
but what we're seeing is the the opportunity for people to stay connected stay productive at work and so thank you jay for giving me the opportunity to share some of my insights with the folk out there great well i wanted to start with as much good news as i could come up with and um you know there are there, these are a couple of slides that came from one of the groups i'm a member of and um china's recovery is underway and a lot of the, the key factors um, including um, obviously the health turnaround are going in the right direction and um, china's reversal of cases started four weeks post quarantine um, so that's a little bit of good news and for two consecutive days china has uh, no new local infections so uh, at least there's a little bit of good news that way uh, my friend dr mark milstein put out a video and he talked um, from a, a medical perspective um, about uh, treatments and cures and there's a couple very positive things um, they've hit the news over the last couple of days but you could uh, find dr mark milstein's uh, report on a um, he's, he's very um, uh, enthusiastic about an ebola drug that saved people who were thought to be dying or you know, saved quote uh, turn turn them around very, very significant. So um, reality is we're, we're probably gonna be at home for two, four, six weeks. And um, these, uh, you know, it's, it's getting more serious because it's now becoming government, government mandated. Um, and uh, so we're, we're all definitely gonna be working from home. Um, so just before we start, I'm gonna make sure everybody's muted again. Um, and if, if uh, Henry Cruz, um, I see your phone is not muted. If you could do us a favor mute your phone that'd be great just so there's no background noise and that's one of the things you deal with uh, with these virtual meetings so um, getting into uh, our presentation today we're, as i mentioned earlier we're going to really cover three things first of all setting up your business uh, number two setting up your space your, your personal workspace and that's something jeff's expert at and uh, third maintaining some business um, and doing business in the digital environment so um, in terms of offices, uh, I've been a part of a number of calls this week uh, with companies and, and helping some of our clients get set up. And there's a lot of things that um, we've got to figure out. So um, one of the challenges for law firms and other organizations with lots of calls is just who's gonna answer the phone? I mentioned my friend, friend Henry's on the line and uh, Henry uh, th thankfully set us up with uh, VOIP, uh, Voice Over Internet Protocol Phones. And um, if you have a system like this, you can actually transfer your calls wherever you want. So if you had a couple of receptionists in a traditional business environment, um, they could still take the calls and then route the calls um, to your sales force. There's other little things um, that we've, we've all got to remember. Like um, I had to remember this week to go and check the mail because you know nobody's checking the mail at the office and there's a couple of Amazon packages sitting around. So you've got some physical things to figure out in the work environment in addition to the digital. But we're gonna spend most of our time, uh, or most of my time talking about sorting out your technology. So um, there's definitely challenges out there. Um, there's a rumor that there's no laptops available. And again, these are some physical things that we have to figure out. If um, you wanna move your workforce from the office to the home and they have traditional computers, um, we've gotta get them computer access. So some people will have a home computer, but good news, um, Dell will still ship you some laptops so there is, are, are still some laptops out there. There's a lot of different technologies we use. And um, one of them that's been great for our company, we've been on Slack for about five years. Um, and it's a popular uh, uh, stock. The stock did very well when it, when it launched. Is um, It's basically like group chat for offices. So we use it for simple things like um, our team can post anything we need to order from Amazon. We order all our kitchen supplies that way. Um, and here we're just all talking about everyone's work from home environment. And it's just, you know, kind of like a social component, but we use it for business. Like this is a new business and um, I'm working with the directors and they're creating um, a new PowerPoint deck for one of our clients. So uh, Slack is a really good communications tool if you haven't tried it. Uh, another one I don't have in the presentation that we're using really well for some different groups is called WhatsApp. And um, I'm on a group of executives talking about coronavirus. Um, one of our boards of directors is using WhatsApp um, and another networking group is using WhatsApp. So that's another one to consider. And it's really, it's really just chat. It's like group chat on the phones. So uh, we're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about virtual meetings and, 
and obviously those of you who came here today and thank you for being here um, were able to log on effectively to a go to meeting and um, virtual meetings have a lot of real functionality for the office so um, first thing I wanted to do is differentiate a lot of people are asking me you know what's the difference between a zoom and a go to meeting and a Skype meeting um, and frankly they're, they're all relatively the same in terms of their functionality. Um, the two big ones, as far as I'm concerned, are Zoom and GoToMeeting. Uh, we've been using GoToMeeting for our client meetings um, for over 10 years. And they even sponsored my podcast years ago. So we've been big GoToMeeting fans. Um, and then um, I'll talk more about Zoom in a minute. Uh, things like Uber Conference, we use a lot at our company as well. Google Hangouts are great. Um, the other day, um, the, I think the Uber Conference meeting was busy, and so we just hopped on a Google Hangout join.me, uh, freeconferencecall.com, and Skype all have a similar set of functionality. So very similar to what we're doing today where um, you can present slides, you can speak, you can see uh, people on the cameras, um, very, very functional. Now, one of the hiccups uh, we're discovering this week is uh, both uh, Zoom and GoToMeeting uh, have been having trouble with uh, outages. This is a tool called Down Detector, and it shows um, GoToMeetings had a lot of problems, Zoom's had a few problems, um, I'm starting to become a Zoom convert, and mostly because Zoom is an online app, and it doesn't rely on as much back-end technology and downloading the app um, actually on your computer. So it runs as a, as a more virtual um, application that people can just see the screens. Um, so uh, the Zoom stock has responded, as, as we, would, we would guess. And so in all of this um, you know, upheaval in our economy, there's a lot of good things for some companies. Um, so uh, obviously, if you're in the toilet paper business or in the video meeting business, it's a good time. And Zoom stock rebounded from a low of 62 back in December up to $125. So if these are the big two, Zoom and GoToMeeting, um, I wanted to just give a quick comparison. So um, a lot of people are confused, like, do you need this? Do you need to buy it? Do you need to, to sign up for it? So only the person hosting the meeting or your company would need to sign up for it. And Zoom has a great feature. You can get unlimited meetings for free, and those meetings are only up to 40 minutes. So that's one of the things to be aware of if you're using it for like a charity board or, or an organization or a group, and you buy the free one, you will only get 40 minutes for your meeting and then you'll be cut off. Now GoToMeeting has a free 14-day trial, and with both of these tools, you can have unlimited meetings. But there is only, there's a hiccup there because there's only one host. So your company can't have unlimited meetings. Every registration or every account you create can have unlimited meetings. Um, and they both have a relatively low cost entry product um, that really does most of what any one company would be able to do. So uh, for $14.99 with Zoom, you get one host and up to 100 participants in a meeting. So if all you wanna do is have a company meeting every morning, um, that's fantastic. The one host is sufficient. But if you want to set up multiple meetings, you'll need a host for every meeting. So for years, we've had two accounts with GoToMeeting and one with Zoom. So if we had three different meetings going on, we could always cover that off. Uh, the GoToMeeting baseline product is $12, one organizer, and up to 150 participants. And then um, what some of the key features um, is cloud recording and Zoom includes cloud recording, um, go to meeting, you have to pay an, a, a, up to their next level. I think it's called professional to get the cloud recording. Um, and both have more sophisticated uh, things and you'll see that uh, broken down. So, you know, you can, you can have um, like a non zoom, you can have your own URL, your own company name for your meetings um, with the business product. And then with enterprise, you get other features like 500 participants, dedicated customer service and things like that. So uh, lots of um, choices, but if you're really just getting started, all you need is the basic package. And then there's a bunch of different ways to use virtual meetings. Um, one of them is just that morning water cooler conversation, like to keep everyone in touch and to have the camaraderie of the business and the office, you could have a virtual water cooler every morning. And you could just say that, hey, every morning at 9.15, we're having a water cooler, and we just wanna know how everyone's doing. We don't even wanna talk business. Um, another very important use of the Zoom meetings and the CEO group I was on, um, a, a couple of the CEOs have held virtual town halls. 
And I think that's really, really important in this environment for the company to communicate um, business things. Um, a, a lot of the CEOs got questions about layoffs. So you want to be prepared and you want to be proactive in talking to all of your employees. You want to manage the conversation. Another really powerful way to use these virtual meetings is for daily huddles. And Vern Harnish wrote an awesome book I highly recommend called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. And Rockefeller and Steve Jobs used to use the daily huddles, and lots of us use them now. It's just a five to 10 minute meeting. It's always at the same time. Ours is at 9.15. And you talk about the priorities, everyone's priorities, the company's priorities. Um, there's a term in the book called rocks, like moving a big rock uphill. So you want to avoid any any possible train wrecks. And these, these go-to meetings are great because they often save a lot of time, uh, needless sort of back and forth, because you sort of get everything uncovered. And then if there's a big, big rock, this is the term or a big problem that you can't solve in the 15 minute meeting, you can make it a topic for a weekly meeting and maybe assign a couple of people to handle that. So you can do those with these, these go-to meetings, very, very powerful. Um, another term people are using is the virtual coffee. So like the virtual water cooler, um, you could meet up every morning at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock and just see how everyone's doing. And I think that's a really um, powerful idea. And um, our, our CEO group just booked our first virtual happy hour for this Friday at five o'clock. And so everyone's gonna get together with a cocktail um, and have a virtual uh, happy hour. By the way, I think this guy's gone a little bit too far uh, with his uh, hazmat suit at home. Um, and another um, powerful tool is um, for networking. So our, our networking group held our first virtual meeting. Uh, tons of people showed up. It was really, really effective. Um, everyone was able to um, you know, talk about ideas and uh, share leads, which is very, very important for business. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So if you wanna get started as a company, just create that Zoom account, go to settings um, and, and figure out what you wanna do. So like I'm the host, I'm, I'm, I have video on, I'm, I'm, my participants are gonna have video. Um, I'm going to allow telephone and computer audio, um, and you can set passwords and all, all different kinds of settings uh, for your meetings. Then the first thing you want to do is schedule a meeting. Again, very, relatively simple. Just pick the time, the length of the meeting, uh, the time zone, etc. You can do passwords or not, as I mentioned. And then it'll give you a URL, um, like the one I sent you, you folks for the meeting today. Um, and then you just click copy this invitation and you get a really easy uh, tool that you can send out to everybody um, by email and by social media and different uh, social tools. A few tips, um, it's great if you have people log in in advance and try the technology first. Um, video and audio is great. Um, as I did at the start of this meeting, you wanna ask the attendees to mute because if, if someone's uh, driving, which obviously is less, less common today um, or has a lot of background noise, it can be really disturbing to the meeting. And then if, if someone has audio problems, get them to call in from a phone because sometimes the limit of the go-to meeting or the Zoom meeting is the internet capability. Um, and this is another tip I heard on a, on a call yesterday. If you're running an important meeting at home, you wanna make sure that your, your kids aren't streaming three different Netflix from three different devices and everyone's sucking up all your internet capability. So it might be time for, for everyone to play a game or read a book. Um, and obviously uh, keep keep the noise down in the back. And a final couple tips before uh, Jeff talks about the actual space. Um, I'm uh, my friend Bruce Turkel, uh, who Jeff mentioned earlier, um, has designed his background. Um, so I I just threw the uh, uh, the bookshelf up in the background, but Bruce has done a really nice job sort of configuring his space. Uh, and he's a beautiful art director, so he would. Um, and some tips from Zoom is you all want to look at things like lighting. So I got a little bit of front lighting here, um, blocked out as much as I could of the sunlight. Um, and some advanced tips, um, they, th this um, presenter at, at Zoom was using the Brio Ultra HD Pro webcam, and she was using a Loom Cube for front lighting, and you can see how much better her, her, uh, her uh, setup looks uh, with that uh, professional. And then there's even a tool in Zoom you can touch up your appearance. So it actually does a little virtual uh, Photoshopping for you. And they have this incredible virtual background. So if we were on a Zoom meeting, I could use my virtual background that I downloaded from a website called pexels.com. Um, and that's pretty valuable. If, like if, you, if you have the kids and everything is in the background, you can use these virtual backgrounds. 
So uh, again, that's with Zoom, not with uh, GoToMeeting, but uh, pretty, pretty cool. So uh, next up, um, Jeff's gonna talk about setting yourself up at home. Uh, so I'll turn it over to the Chief Home Officer. Jeff, take well, it away. Thanks, Jay, and I appreciate the setup. Uh, and, and one thing to keep in mind, uh, you know, this is all new to many people. And many companies don't, had never thought about telework, sending their people home to work. I mean, when I first started covering this years ago, um, there was a lot of resistance, a lot of pushback. And imagine 31 years ago when I started working from home, uh, it was not an acceptable, <clears throat> you know, sort of in the in the vibe of the moment and the, the, the times, it was not acceptable. Now we don't have a choice. They say in telework that it has to be voluntary, that the, both the manager or the company and the employee who's going home to work both have to want it. Um, best case scenario. This is not a best case scenario. This is Dickensian, as it were. It was the best of times, the worst of times. We're going to do what we can to manage and get through this. So that said, we've all been sent home to work. Uh, we are no longer, for the most part, white collar workers are no longer going into the corporate office. So you're at home. You walk in with a new sort of mindset of how am I going to make this work? You have to pick your space. There's a couple things to keep in mind when picking your space. You know, you have options. You might have a, a, a bedroom that is unused. In my home office, we've always had a bedroom. This, this uh, image you see here is essentially of a bedroom that is a dedicated home office. One thing to keep in mind, the power tool of the home office to me has always been a door that closes. Uh, it can keep dogs out and kids out during the day when you're working. Um, it can also close the office at you know, either early in the morning or the end of the day when you, you pass by and you say, hey, maybe I'll go back in and, you know, do a little bit more work, check my email, whatever. You close that door, it turns off the office, gets it out of sight, so you're not going there. So, you know, something to keep in mind. Again, dedicated space can boost your function, your focus, and your productivity. Uh, another option is vacant, you know, those vacant bedrooms, converted garage, garages, finished basements, attics, other unused rooms. You know, a lot of times you don't have that option, but you make it work as best you can. And again, the door that closes can stifle the ruckus and uh, and and keep the family at bay and keep the office at bay after hours. Um, when we see some of the other things to keep in mind, again, when you're picking your space, uh, you know, you want to look for lighting. You want to look for airflow. You want to look for the things that are going to make it work for you. And, you know, th whether it's a quiet corner of a den, something that is away from the hustle and bustle of the family. Um, you know, if there's ways to work around, th this is again, being new to all, you have to try and make it, make it work for you. So if you don't have that extra office, you, the, you know, a, a bedroom or an attic, you know, some have finished attics, finished basements, um, you know, you go for a corner room, you go for a space like this, which is a space off the, off the beaten path of, the, you know, the side of the room. It's away from the hustle and bustle as much as possible. Um, you know, we'll talk a little bit about, <coughs> excuse me, kids in the home office, but, you know, you want to be away from the cacophony. And then one of the other things I say is one of the power tools is the, the door that closes in all our home offices. We've had that. In fact, we had French doors like these in one of our home offices where it allowed me to see out if, if one of my children came to the door, they learned over time to knock. You know, if we may back up for a second, this is new to all. This is new to the teleworker. This is new to the manager. This is new to the spouse or partner. This is certainly new to the children. Um, you know, our oldest now is 28. So she and her younger siblings were raised in the home office market and, and environment. So they came to know to, if they came into my office, they come in quietly. Uh, we, <clears throat> some of us may remember the video from a couple of years ago, there was this uh, gentleman uh, working from South Korea and he was he was uh, opining on one of the news networks about, you know, the, the current political conditions in, you know, between South and North Korea and in walks his toddler sort of proud and haughty, just walking in. And then the nanny reaches in behind or the mother, I forget who it was, to, to take the child back out. Um, that may happen. And, you know, as a friend of mine who I'm on a radio show with frequently says, this is like live radio. This is like live TV. You know, things are going to happen. Everyone's got to understand we've made a pivot here. School in many in many localities is out. It's been shut down. So you are going to have kids at home. Uh, you might have a nanny who's who is who's, who's able to work with you if, if she is has been deemed clear. You might have kids from the neighborhood who if, if they have been asymptomatic, they might be able to come and serve as babysitters. We used to have a lot of that going on in our household. These are some of the options to keep 
in mind when working with kids. Again, some of the options for, for space, a quiet corner of the den, a living room, a bedroom, something off the beaten path. If you need privacy, like the image we showed a moment ago of the office off to the side, you can have potted plants that can work in there. You can have this, I've always spoken of the Japanese shoji screen, um, which is a divider that you can just put up and you can work from behind it. Um, and it and it sort of separates your office from the space. Again, it gets it visually out of your out of your line of sight, and it gets it visually out of the family's line of sight. And it doesn't make if your if your office is a bit look. I I work from a dedicated home office. It's not always clean at day's end, so there's paper strewn about, and so it, it's it can get messy. So you want something that might make it less of an eyesore. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, um, again, away from the hustle of family well lighted well ventilated you want to don't want to feel like you're working in a dungeon or a cave here so as best you can i have a ceiling fan up top i have light coming in from windows on the sides here i have a, a task lamp above my desk i have overhead lighting through the ceiling fan it really keeps it open airy comfortable um, especially when, for example, I do have to close the doors. I, I, I'm one who needs air moving in my space, so I often have the fan on. Um, you can't see it, but outside, I'm, I'm in South Florida outside. It's, you know, my palms are out there. It's, it's beautiful to look out, to have a view of the outdoors. Um, it's very feng shui. Uh, if you're gonna, it, it's, it's against feng shui to me, for me to be facing a wall, but to be, have that out to my side uh, is, is enlightening, it's soothing. Um, you know, and we'll get into ergonomics in a minute, but it also allows you to take your eyes off the screen to mentally step away from the moment as well. And again, all this creates a space to call your own. In this moment, whether we're here for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, many months, um, it becomes a space that becomes your own, something you can work from. So it's important that you have that and you're comfortable. So where is your office? This image we're looking at here is bathed in, 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 in sunlight, which is really nice. Assuming it's not a Western exposure which I have, which makes the, the home office very hot in the afternoon. So I put up a couple of pull down, dark pull down shades that really curb the light coming in and the heat, radiant heat coming through. We also do have palms outside, some Robolini palms, which cut, the, cut the, the direct sunlight and as well as the glare. Glare is from an ergonomic point of view, from a practical point of view, glare on your screen and glare when you're in presentations, as Jay said, um, can be difficult. It's, uh, you know, we're not at, uh, we don't have a director. We don't have someone looking over us and saying, okay, the light's going to be perfect here. It's going to be over there. You got to do it yourself and, and cut those as much as possible. The image we're seeing here, where is your office? Again, kids are part of this scene. Um, you need to figure out a way to work them into it, to work around them. So this is a, a picture of an, a small office, a desk with a table for the for the parent or the worker, as well as a small uh, a small uh, table with chairs for the child. What we learned when when my kids were growing up, we were able to, uh, you know, if we kept them focused, kept them doing something, whether it was homework when they were a little older, whether it was playing with toys, whether it was in a playpen outside those French doors in one of my home offices, so I could see them, they became very comfortable to it. If your children, we rarely, you know, sort of set them in front of a, a at the time, a VHS tape and the TV and left them there, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And if they're on an iPad, if they're in front of the TV, I see Jay nodding in, in agreement back there. But, you know, whatever it takes to, to keep them focused and out of your hair. And sometimes you just got to punt. You got to realize that if you can't work to, during their nap time, that and you're in as a manager, you have to understand that from your employees. And as an employee, you have to understand that sometimes you just have to be with the kids because especially the youngins, they're going to require your time. And especially since many parents now are being de facto homeschool teachers. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Uh, a topic here that, that has really become important, <coughs> excuse me, is the concept of ergonomics. If you, ergonomics truly is space being designed to fit the human experience and the human you know, person. So ergonomics is not an, a, a, a euphemism or code for expensive. Ergonomics is just having the right chair, the right desk, the right lighting, the right you know, creature comforts around you so that you work comfortably. This can include your chair, desk, lighting, mobility, how you get around, what you do, what you're able to do. 
Um, and you'll see that I, I was on with a, with a coworker. I'm a freelancer, but I was on, I, I think of my, my clients as my partners. I was on with a coworker who was sent home to, to uh, telework for the first time in, in ever. She had never teleworked. She would occasionally do some work from home, but she brought her computer home. She had a desk at home and she was uncomfortable. And she had never worked eight or nine hour days, which she does in the office. She had never worked from the home office like that. So I said, well, how high is your desk? How does your chair compare to what you use in the office? You know, are there things that you can do if you take these measurements, maybe go out and buy an ergonomic chair to make it more comfortable for you. Maybe put a, a little footstool underneath your legs to prop your feet up a little bit to get the pressure off your lower, your lower back and the back of your thighs. Um, you know, your, your uh, I think it's a hamstring on the back of the thighs to make sure that it's not straining muscles that you and, and regions and joints that you don't usually use. So, you know, ergonomics can help keep the chiropractor away. So it's important to, to you know, do what you can to make it happen if you can forward. Um, so, you know, what we look at in the chair, it has, we'll have an image in a second, but we'll go through these now, it has adjustable armrests, back and seat pan, uh, which is essentially the, the, the seat pan is the seat you sit on, back, you know, adjustable back, ideally five legs with casters for mobility. Um, it is fully adjustable all the way around. The arms will adjust up and down and they might tilt, they might tilt outward. Um, and again, you have a pitch where the seat pan will go up or back in order to pitch how you're sitting in the seat. So sometimes if it's too far down, you'll feel like you're sliding out. Sometimes it's too far back. You'll feel like you've got not enough weight distributed out to your feet to keep you comfortable. Um, and again, you want a breathable fabric. I've never been one for those leather executive chairs because I work from home and I often work in shorts. So, you know, you're, you get, it can get uncomfortable working in a fabric. All my chairs that I've ever had that have been, whether Herman Miller Aeron type chairs or a hundred dollar chair from an office depot have been just, they've had mesh fabric. So I can, my body breathes on it. It doesn't get stifling. And again, at the bottom there, 99 to 400 to 700, whatever you want to spend, they don't have to, it is not a euphemism for, for expensive. So keep that in mind uh, when looking at your, at your chair. Jeff, um, uh, that's yes. one of those ironic things. I, I bought the fancy Herman Miller chair and, uh, we, we had all these $99 chairs for, for the rest of the team. And I love the $99 chair. It yeah. was way better, way better for my back. So um, Yeah, and it's something to keep in mind because you know those are and there are there are great chairs. And you know, that is the the expensive, you know, the the gold standard, but you don't sometimes need it. And keep in mind also, um, if you're a manager or an employee who's been sent home to work and you're looking at your kitchen chair to work from or some, you know, 10 year old office chair that doesn't function as well as it did. Maybe you ask your employer, maybe you tell your employees, we're going to give you a, a morning to go back to the office. We're going to schedule you go in and grab a chair. Um, this might be time to bring the Clorox wipes and wipe everything down, uh, which you should be doing in your office anyway. But instead of investing a lot of money for a, for a, a business an office chair at the home office that you don't know how long we're going to be there, maybe if you have them at work, allow your employees to go go back to the office, grab them uh, before we're on some more of a stern, uh, you know, sort of mandatory lockdown, go grab the chair and bring it back rather than absorb that expense. Or give them a stipend and let them buy what they need. Because if telework works for your organization, you're going to go forward with this. You're not going to want to skimp on, on, on furnishings and then have people be making claims on your, on your health plan because they're going to see a chiropractor or an orthopedist. Ergonomics, when we look at the desk, it's form versus function. So if you're an attorney, if you're an accountant who's been sent home to work, you're going to need a lot more space to lay papers out. It's tax season. I know they're talking about uh, pushing it back to maybe July 15 as the tax filing deadline. But are you a paper pusher or a mouse jockey? You know, how are you uh, working, what's your style? You may not need, as this, as right here, a secretarial desk is 30 by 60 and executive is 36 by 72. Typically 27 inches from the floor to the, or from, yeah, from the floor to the top of the desk. Find what, what works for you. Mine is 30. It's a custom desk that I had built and 30 inches was right for me. But you find what works for you and your needs. If you don't need a lot of space to lay papers out or open books or whatever, um, or if you can get away with you know, two monitors, say, or three monitors on smaller size desks, you do what works for you. And then finally, you want the monitor. You might not even think about this, but I'm, I'm looking at my, my monitor. We're gonna have an image in a second. And my eyes are slightly down. So if I'm looking, my, my camera's up here. If I'm looking, 
center monitor. It's about eight to nine inches down, which is angling my neck down, which is a more natural appearance as opposed to having your, your neck sort of craned up a little bit. So think about that. It might be you have to raise your monitor a little bit, put it on, on a book or on some sort of platform. It might be you have to raise your chair so that the monitor's a little lower. Um, you know, one thing you do is you change daily. You might want to adjust your chair when you sit down the first time for the, you know, every day for the first couple of days, see what sits, you know, suits you right and, and work with all those adjustments and see what work, uh, sort of works best for your, your, uh, for your comfort, your creature comfort and your own ergonomics. You can go to the next slide. Tip, one the, of the uh, tips that came from my WhatsApp group, a bunch of the folks were frustrated because they had big monitors at work yeah. and they didn't have monitors at home. And so one of the hacks, one of the guys suggested was if you have an HDMI cord, you can hook it up to your TVs because most TVs today are, are really great monitors. So all of right. a sudden you have like a, you know, 36, 75 inch screen. Um, it's really, really effective. It, it's worked for me in a few pinches. Yeah, good luck getting that out of the kids' hands when you're uh, trying to, you know, Chromecast or HDMI to the uh, to the TV, right. and the kids are like, I want to watch Incredibles again or whatever. So, <laughs> you know, so here's here's a quick look. So you look at, at at everything in this picture, sort of speaking to what we were talking about. If you look at where the the individual is looking forward, if they're looking forward, they're looking at the top of the screen. It doesn't show them, you know, angling down a little bit, but you can see if they did, they'd be looking at the middle of the screen, which is a little bit better. So that's roughly where your, <coughs> excuse me, your eyes should be at the top, 27 inches to the height of the, to the table. It's, and you can see that this desk looks like it's adjustable. Adjustability is almost like the catchphrase of ergonomics. You wanna make sure that it's that it, it can be adjusted. And chatting with the person uh, yesterday from my office or from my client, uh, I asked, is her desk adjustable? She said, no. I said, well, you may need to put the, the legs of the desk, you know, put something under them to raise the desk if the desk is too low. You may need to raise your chair. I said, that's when I suggested to her to go to her office and see about getting a chair from there or seeing about getting a stipend and picking up a hundred dollar chair from, from home. So the options exist. And so some of these will be making this available, I believe um, this, this video. So you'll be able to find this later. Here's yeah, another right. discussion. Yeah, here's another discussion of lighting. We had spoken of lighting and actually you can see they have what looks like a Dyson fan on the table as well, um, which moves air. And for me, air is, is key, but you know, I was discussing, I have a task lamp right above on one of the shelves above me. I have overhead lighting, I have natural lighting that comes in. Uh, your mood changes as your day goes on and you'll find, and, and many of you, many people are have been sort of de facto teleworkers or at least home officers. They might not work from home 100% of the time, but you might amble into the office. At, at, I woke up early, so I'm in, the, I'm in my home office or my home-based workspace at, at 5 a.m. So I have natural lighting, the, the east is through the doors behind me. So I have the sunrise and the natural lighting of the sunrise that comes in. So I turn on my overhead light, it's very subdued. I have my tea. There's a different vibe, there's a different ethos, there's a different sort of zen, as it were, that happens at different day parts. And so you'll find that. And so my most productive time, for example, is first thing in the morning. And so that's the, this office shows how the light is in there. They have the task lamp going on. They're moving some air. It's all about you. And it's all about making it work for what you need. Um, we're going to talk for a moment about scheduling your day um, because it's all about, the, you know, sort of dividing your day into day parts and how you can make it work for yourself. Uh, one thing we're going to look at here is a power tip for employers and a power tip for employees. Employers who are on board today, the managers who are on board, don't tell your teleworkers, but you're going to get more hours out of them probably because they're going to enjoy working, not enjoy, but they'll find themselves working early. The person I was talking to earlier this week said, I'm in the car at 8 a.m. to get to my office by 930. So she's like, I was ready to go at eight. I was at my desk at 8 a.m. She's not home till 7, 730 at night. So she worked a little later during the day. I said, well, I hope you're taking some of that time during the day to get out and maybe go around the neighborhood. She said she took a walk around the neighborhood that she hasn't done, you know, typically doesn't do otherwise. You can't keep your butt in the chair all day. You gotta get up and get out. And then a power tip for teleworkers, don't work longer hours just because it's there. Okay, so we're not gonna tell your managers here, but you're gonna, you know, you will be enticed to possibly work longer hours. Just become the master of your clock and calendar. Figure out when you're, when you're gonna sort of punch in, when you're gonna punch out. You're going to take breaks during the day. 
you're going to note all this because again as it says you know time is our, our most precious resource how are you going to maximize it without getting burned out this is new you've got might have kids at home you might have your spouse at home you're not used to the new sort of dynamic of, of family around you in the moment you're you may have pets, a dog, a cat, or multiples that you're not, that are not used to you being around. The cat's saying, oh my, this person's home all day now. What am I going to do? So you're going to have to get used to, to all of this. So make sure that you're not getting stressed. Um, kids, it's a big issue. If any of you have young children out there, um, as I said, you've become a teleworker, you know, a, 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 an employee who's working from home. And in many instances, you've become a de facto homeschool teacher. So as the best case scenario, Rule number one for those with kids at home or young children, telework is no substitute for child care. So you're not working from home in the best of situations, not, you know, coronavirus situation. You're not working from home so that you don't have to put your kids into into uh, daycare or preschool or whatever. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, this physical distancing that we spoke of before, social distancing, commas, you know, slash physical distancing, it requires everyone to juggle. And you're going to have to sort of work and see what works. If you can find a, a, a child from around the neighborhood who you can talk to the parents and see if they've been, you know, have they been exposed? Is anyone showing symptoms? Have they been on sort of a quarantine where they've not been exposed? You might be able to have that child work for you as a, as a, <coughs> excuse me, a nanny, as a, as a babysitter. We did that when my kids were young. Uh, kids would come home. We'd have a, had a girl from around the corner who was done with school at like 2.30 in the afternoon. She'd come and, and watch the kids and play with them and feed them snacks and keep them busy and, and whatever. So you, sh you and then the other thing is we discussed is, is shifting your work to go around children's naps and, and sleep time. One thing that my wife used to chide me on is if my kids slept in in the morning or if they, you know, when they didn't have preschool or, or they never had daycare because daddy was always here, but I was able to work around it. Um, and if they took a nap, it went down for a nap at one and they didn't wake up till 4.30, I'd let them nap. And then you, my wife would come home and the kids are all wired, you know, because they're now wide awake. Um, back up one, if you would. Um, you know, there's there's been a, a lot of discussion, child, you know, being no substitute for, for child care. Uh, this is a, a picture that was that made social media circuit. Um, I believe this is Ivanka Trump uh, with a couple of her children, or, or maybe this is something that she shared. Um, and she took a lot of heat for it because she said it's a time to, to play with your kids and bond with your kids. Whatever works for you. You know, it, it's a model that you have to make work. And especially in these trying times, employers have to understand and you have to, to under, you know, sort of make it make it work if you can forward now. Um, you know, so a lot of the things, physical distancing, we're going to have to juggle. This is not what you want. This is me when my our two oldest kids, our daughter, you can see there's probably three, three and a half. And our son's about one and a half. And we have a dog outside the French door onto the patio. This is not telework. It's not those pictures of kids sitting in your lap and daddy or mommy are typing away. No, it doesn't work that way. But again, make it work for you. So if I'm there, just have them in my lap for a moment just to bond with the kids. That's all good. And it's, you so know, as long as you know, upgraded that computer, right? Uh, yeah, you know what? The 15 inch uh, cathode ray CRT, yeah, I got rid of it. I went for I'm now on a, a, a 16 inch you know, flat screen. No, we're a little bigger than that. And then take advantage of those naps. There's my boy asleep in his little race car bed. So you know what? Sleeping babies, they're a beautiful thing. So you, you do it as best you can. And, uh, you know, we, we roll with it. Um, again, uh, one thing we'll get into is talking about distractions, whether it's social media, where it's whether it's TV, you know, you have to remember you're at work fast. You can go to the next slide. Um, you know, social media, it's the bane of my existence in some ways because I'm I'm all over Facebook and social media, whether it's, for example, doing something like promoting this or some of the side hustles I have going on. You know, part of it is is business and part of it is is fun. Uh, you know, it's it you have to find a time. I, I, I did an experiment years ago for an article I wrote where I put myself on a social media embargo. Um, and one thing I have never had is a TV in my office. I was online with somebody yesterday and they were talking about how the TV is difficult. I don't have even a cable outlet in my in my home office. And we have a genie now that has you just hooked it up to a node so you can move the TV wherever you can get a Wi-Fi signal. Um, I've never had a TV in my home office because I don't need that distraction. And then YouTube came along and, you know, screwed that uh, sort of belief and, and sort of philosophy. So it's again what works for you. 
whatever's going to keep you focused. This isn't a great home office because he's sitting in a, you know, on a coffee table doing his work. Um, managing with care. Managers are, you've been thrust into this. Your company may never have thought to have you as a teleworker, um, may never thought of ha having to train their managers and what they're going to do. Um, you know, it's the best of times. It's the worst in times. Learn from each other. Seek guidance. How am I doing, guys? Am I am I managing? Are you, are you getting the guidance you need? The things that Jay spoke about early, you know, morning, you know, sort of water coolers, you know, chats, you know, check ins. They all work well. And make sure you keep in touch with you know the the organization, but also the people that you work with. You keep that experience of of the the personality and the con the connections that you have, uh, so that you're staying in touch with people and you're not becoming isolated. Because isolation is horrible. You know, one of the the, the chief complaint of telework is detachment from the team. You know, it's about physical distancing, not social distancing. As Jason said, use some of these these apps to to you know connect with the team but i spoke to somebody yesterday i said what are you using them for they said i use it for music for movies for games we talk about pets we talk about cooking and sharing recipes and that's especially important now uh, because you're cooking for yourself or you're going out and, and getting takeout to bring home so that's some of the things we have to have to keep in mind and it's about having an open mind to how all this rolls um go ahead so I think we can blow through some of the, the coming things, you know, again, avoiding isolation, be flexible. I'm going to be, damn it. Anybody can name that reference. Uh, plan for tomorrow. Uh, you know, this crisis is going to subside at some point. What are you going to do? How are you going to work telework into your future, both business continuity plans, as well as how your organization uh, is going to, in the best of times, make it work for you because it's a great you know jay spoke about voip i've interviewed people in the past who have voip phones that when a hurricane came they just grabbed their phone off their desk and they would run away to a different market that was going to be unaffected by an impending storm natural disaster i mean obviously this is not something that you can run from but if you have voip and you're able to you have to work from a home office or some other office than the workplace the office you know the, the traditional office voip is wonderful but you got to think about these things if you never have this is the time. And these are just some uh, some images. They're not matches, they're images courtesy of. So Jay, I'll toss it back to you. That's awesome, Jeff. And thank you so much for sharing. In particular, I'm gonna be spending a lot of time with that ergonomics with getting my chair right and the screen right and uh, staying away from the extra chiro chiropractor. Yes. Yeah. So um, the final section we want to spend some time on keeping business flowing and uh, as much as possible, um, maintaining uh, or finding a new normal, shall we say. So this is a chart I call the internet marketing model. And a lot of companies have already come to us and said, hey, we want to figure out how to go online because our store is closed, because our um, supply chain is shut down. And we want to try and figure out how to do some online business. So uh, this is kind of like the basic chart I, I, I use. So if, if you imagine your website's the home base, um, and your, your mobile version of your website is more important than ever today. Um, so everything's going to pretty much drive into your website, um, unless you have the opportunity to sell on Amazon or another platform. Um, and so the, the first place you're going to get traffic, um, get leads, get business, is people actively Googling, searching for your products and services. Um, Yahoo and Bing uh, still represent about 15% of the market, um, and Google and Yahoo and Bing paid advertising is an immediate way to get traction to your website. SEO or search engine optimization is a more long-term opportunity where your website's gonna come up in the organic results. There's a number of affiliate networks like Mission Junction and Share of Sale um, and the Amazon affiliate network where you can send traffic to your website and you'll only pay those affiliate partners if they generate a sale for you. So that's another way to generate traffic to your business, uh, partnering up, um, using email. So you definitely want to be back on, on email, communicating with your customers, staying top of mind. I mean, that, that could be a no-brainer for some folks who haven't sent out their MailChimp uh, in six or 12 months. Um, remind your customers you're there. I'm seeing all kinds of sales and special offers coming through. Um, using different feeds like podcasts and, and uh, social media feeds, of course. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, represented by these, these graphics are a great way to stay top of mind with your customers. Um, these little uh, websites are representative of links 
to your website. Very important for SEO, search engine optimization. Um, and this bottom portion representing of the shopping cart and testing. Um, testing A, B, test offer A versus offer B, landing page A versus landing B, landing page B. And that's how we do the paid advertising. We do a lot of testing. We test different networks. We test Google versus Bing. We test offer A versus offer B. And we test landing page design A versus landing page design B. And if A beats B, then we test A versus C. So in a week, half the traffic's going to see A, half the traffic's going to see C. And then the right-hand portion represents remarketing. Um, so these little um, websites represent um, remarketing ads. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with those as a consumer. If you're not using it for business, it's one of the no-brainers in terms of digital marketing. And, and we've seen that as a consumer where you go to a website, you're looking at a pair of sneakers, or maybe a, a couple months ago you were booking a flight, and then every website you go to, you see those exact same sneakers, or you see an offer for a flight to the city that you were, were inquiring about. And that's called remarketing. And the way we do that in the marketing business is we're able to uh, capture a cookie, set a cookie on your machine, basically identify the unique identifier number of your device, your computer or your cell phone. And then when you come back, one of the ad networks like the Google Advertising Network recognizes your device and we're able to show you an ad for the, the exact website you were previously on. So typically, if it costs like $10 to generate a lead from Google or Bing, it only costs $1 or $2 using remarketing. So once someone's been to your website, it comes, becomes very cost effective to convert them. Um, these are representative of like follow-on newsletters, uh, follow-on emails, and a newsletter program. So if you do get someone's email, obviously you want to market to them, as I mentioned earlier, on a regular basis. Some other opportunities for keeping the lead flow. Um, networking meetings. Um, I've had a tremendous experience over the last year and a half of joining a local networking group in addition to some of the national networking that I do. And some of you on this call are my friends from the networking groups. And uh, we recently, as I mentioned, had our online meeting. And it's a tremendous way for everybody to um, refer business to each other, to help each other with problems. And uh, if you haven't done this before, maybe it's time to do it. And uh, if you look at BNI or Primetime or some of the different networking groups out there, um, BNI is, is like the largest one. They have chapters all around the world. So wherever you are, you're gonna have a BNI group and hopefully they'll, they'll take new members. So the networking groups are always looking for guests and looking for attendees. So what you can do is attend these meetings. They're typically once a week at a regularly scheduled time and you can meet all these folks. And the one good thing about these networking groups is everybody is very positively oriented to helping everybody else. What a great thing. You know, I have 30, 40 different friends in my networking groups who are all looking to help my business in these trying times, and I'm looking out for leads for them. I just sent a lead to the roofer yesterday. Um, and then be very conscious of the one-on-one. -on -one. So the way networking works really, really well is not just showing up once a week for that meeting. You have to build relationships with people in the one-on-one -on -one meetings. And that's really the differentiation that you'll learn from networking. It's not about going to your Chamber of Commerce meeting once a month. It's about meeting one or two people in the Chamber of Commerce meeting who you're going to schedule a coffee or a lunch with after that meeting. And you can keep it going with virtual one-on-ones. So I posted this about a virtual meeting that I did last week instead of traveling. And a, a, an old business contact of mine, Matthew Scott, reached out to me. And I said, hey, Matthew, why don't we catch up? So I'm using another virtual tool. It's called Calendly. Very, very powerful. So I just send him my Calendly link. He can see my calendar and any openings. And then he booked a half an hour meeting. And we did a Zoom meeting. And we caught up. And we found two or three ways we can do business together. And I learned a lot. This is a super smart guy um, whose specialty is marketing for surgeons. Marketing for surgeons. Very specialized um, brand marketer, Matthew Ray Scott. So doing those one-on-one -on -one meetings is a way to keep your relationships and your referrals flow coming in. Another tool we use is DocuSign. So just because you can't have a business meeting, you can set up one of these go-to meetings. You can present your, your presentation, your business, your PowerPoints, your slides, your contracts, and then send a DocuSign and get a signed agreement and keep doing business. Um, a couple of final thoughts. Um, this is a great thing 
Um, our mayor was re-elected here in Boca, nice guy, Scott Singer. He's my Twitter buddy. Uh, he sent out an email and he uh, he's copying this from another community and it's called Boca Helps. And here's a, a website where if you need help, um, if you're elderly, if you need uh, deliveries, maybe as Jeff was talking about with the childcare situation, um, and if you wanna help, you can help. So look for these kinds of opportunities in your community. Um, this is mostly on a volunteer basis, um, but definitely people are gonna be looking for jobs and Jeff mentioned the side hustle. So um, first and foremost, um, you know, if you know waiters, waitresses, um, you know, different types of uh, contract workers who are looking for work, Amazon said they're hiring 100,000 people. Uh, Publix is hiring here in South Florida. So there's definitely opportunities if people are willing to job shift, uh, time shift and take different um, ideas. And then Jeff mentioned the side hustle. Um, we do a ton of work through websites like Upwork and Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R. Uh, we can get people to do copywriting, uh, website design, um, and what, whatever skills you have, there is a gig opportunity for you out there. Um, and so if you have some, some skills or some hobbies or some knowledge in an area, you might be able to use some of these this uh, home time uh, to generate additional revenue um, on the side. The final thought I'll share, I, I'll always um, share this, this concept. And um, this is your basic marketing. Every company can do this. And while you're sitting at home, there's no excuse for not getting it done. So the basic concept of cascading con content, um, and if you've heard me speak, you've heard me talk about this before. It's like a river comes in and then hits a waterfall and the waterfall creates streams and tributaries. Um, and so the cascading effect is where the river comes over the waterfall and cascades. So we're gonna start with an article and all basic internet marketing starts with an article on your website or it could start with a video, it could start with a podcast and then you cascade it throughout all of your other social media. So one of the simple things you could do is write an article, get that article up on your website, write a blog post. Um, I always encourage folks to answer questions. What, what questions are your customers asking right now? Get them up as a blog on your website and then cascade it down throughout your Facebook, your Twitter, you can even go on the new social media, TikTok, Instagram, and, and in business to business and LinkedIn. You wanna stay top of mind with your customers. A very easy way to accomplish your SEO, search engine optimization, get that article on your website, plus cover off all your social media by cascading that throughout all your social media. And two final tips, you can take a weekly article and put it out in your monthly e-newsletters using MailChimp or Constant Contact. And you also wanna post on your Google My Business, which is your Google Maps, which is not gonna be in play today because people aren't gonna get to your location but you can feed the SEO of your Google Maps by adding updates on a weekly basis to the website. So um, that's that's all the um, sort of uh, scheduled content we had. We're happy to take questions in the chat if anyone wants to hop in there. I did have a few questions from folks who, uh, who said they couldn't be here, but they had questions. Um, so one question is, um, can, can you send out a recording? And yes, um, we'll definitely be sending a recording of this. Um, here's, here's a great question from Barb. As an employee, what should I ask my boss regard, regarding expectations of me while I'm working from home? Jeff, you want to take that one? Sure, absolutely, and it's a great question. Um, you know, the expectations are fluid, and you're, you're doing the same, you, you have the same hours available to you. It's a matter of how, what you're getting done and how you're able to get work done. Um, I think it's not unreasonable for you to expect and your boss to anticipate that there's going to be a learning curve here. Um, but, and, and you may have some, I don't know, Barb's situation, whether she has children at home, whether she has a, a parent at home that she's tending to, uh, you know, there are, everyone has situations and, and personal circumstances that, that, that vary and demand of their time. Uh, but it takes a heart to heart. If, if you can't help um you can try and change the mind of an unreasonable boss you're working for like the person i said earlier who gets to, you know she would leave her house at eight so she's in her office at eight and she wouldn't get home till seven so she might be in her home office until seven that's the outlier and i would not expect most people to do that you know notwithstanding what i said about you know the little secrets of of uh, <laughs> for managers and for teleworkers but you have to have a heart to heart 
And if your boss is unreasonable, you have to try and understand where they're coming from and they have to understand where you're coming from. And this just, it, it really takes an open mind on both sides. Um, the next one's not a question so much as a tip came in from Henry, who I mentioned is the voiceover IP expert. I'm happy to share his information. Um, Henry suggested that if you're running one of these go-to meetings, you should use the hard wire for your internet because with everybody in the neighborhood and everybody in your house using Wi-Fi, um, you want to make sure that you can run your go-to meeting or your Zoom meeting effectively. Um, next question is, um, uh, oh, how do you upload a document? So on the different tools like go-to meeting and Zoom, um, there's a share the screen icon. So you just click share your share my screen, and then that's how you show a document on the GoToMeeting. Like I was showing the PowerPoint, and now I just went to the, the screens. Um, next one, Jeff. Um, well, we, we covered this a little bit. Um, how should employees deal with loneliness? Um, but we talked about things like having a virtual water cooler, have a one-on-one -on -one meeting. Um, you know, very important. Part of the business vernacular is the one-on-one -on -one meeting and our company we have a one-on-one -on -one meeting um, with with our boss and, and our employees every month so you want to continue those use the zoom meetings for one-on-ones um, and use this either have a set up a virtual coffee or a, a daily huddle if it's more of a business meeting and maybe use the uh, social happy hours the virtual happy hours jeff what, what do you think about um Loneliness. Covered most of it. I mean, you covered a lot of, of some of the options out there. Isolation with regard to work. So you have two, you know, two ways or two audiences or two touch points in your life that may be affected. You may be feel isolated from the workplace. So you have those those uh, virtual opportunities to connect with your your teams. Um, you know, part of it also is traditional social media without getting sucked into it. You know, maybe because I, I, as I said, I'm an addict when it comes to social media and, and no small part because I have those those, you know, sort of side hustles I work on that keep me engaged with other people. Um, you know, it's it, keep in touch with family members as much as you can. I mean, I have uh, when my mom was alive, we'd have a 10 a.m. call almost every day. And uh, that was that was engaging. Our, our children have, have moved. And so my daughter, who used to call me every morning when she was living down here, she's now living out of town. And we have those calls. And I think that it's not unreasonable to reach out to, to family and friends and loved ones and just stay in touch, keep in touch with the work, you know, people at, back at the workplace because they're probably going through the same thing. And then if you have passions, pastimes, things that you can do, hobbies, maybe throw a little of that into your life. And it's, and it's no problem to do it, I think. Um, during the you know the daytime hours during the, the the work hours because you will be time shifting a bit and working a little bit before traditional hours and after traditional hours so if you take a little time for yourself you know you're not typically going to be taking an hour hour and 15 minute lunch or whatever you would in the office you know you can take a little time to yourself and sort of break up the monotony of the day joe asked um, jay can you discuss video conference software preference for the initial office conferences with new potential clients. So um, let me just go back to this slide. So it doesn't work. Got to get the conference back on. Um, yeah, so I mentioned the two big ones are Zoom and GoToMeeting. Um, the advantage of Zoom is people don't have to download an application. Like if you guys were joining your first GoToMeeting today, you had to download a little application. It seems like that application download is slowing down GoToMeeting and the Zoom meetings are from all my groups and all my input, the Zoom meetings are working better this week. So if I was starting fresh, I would set up a Zoom account. Um, as a host, every salesperson um, or every business person who's setting up client meetings will need a Zoom account. Or as a company, if you only need one or two Zoom accounts and you can share them um, when, when you don't have concurrent meetings, that works too. Like we have um, a general login for the company, and then I have an account for myself. So if it's if it's a client meeting, we can use one. But we, we have, uh, as I mentioned, a couple of go-to meetings and a Zoom and an Uber conference account. Um, some of the other ones, Uber conference, Google Hangouts, join.me, um, and free conference call and Skype work just, just to set up uh, you know, virtual meetings, Facebook Live. There's a bunch of options, but you know, my, my recommendation would be Zoom. 
Um, Jeff, what's your go-to? Um, I don't do a lot. I often fall back to, to what my clients need. So we do use GoToMeeting. I use Skype for some as well. So, you know, it depends on what the clients need. Also, I use for conference calls as opposed to meetings. I'm a, I'm a fan of free conference call. Um, I don't know if people know what that is, but it's as it sounds. They give you a dedicated, it's a dial-in number with a dedicated conference bridge, you know, login that uh, allows you to make a conference call. I don't even know what the limit is anymore for how many people. I did one today where the client I was working with, their their bridge was down. I guess, it, like we said, there a lot of these applications are getting used heavily. Um, so I just shared mine. And it's something that I keep on me as far as the dial-in information. I don't use it a lot, but when I do, I've had it for probably four or five years. And it's, it's mine, as they say, and it's free. If you want to record the call, if you want to uh, you know, share the call. You want to invite people to the call. It's really easy. And it, it gives you also as a home officer, <clears throat> not necessarily as a teleworker, but as a home officer, um, it gives you sort of the cachet of having, let's use my conference line, you know, so you can do that. And it gives people sort of a feel, those who may not know, it gives them a feel. Although when you, when they dial in, the first thing they hear is thank you for your freeconferencecall.com. So, but still it's, it, that's one of the ones that I, I like to use if I'm doing, you know, traditional landline or, you know, wireless cellular uh, calls. So there's a number of them out there, like you're saying, they all have their different features, their, their price points. Um, it's whatever you've used or whatever works for you. Great. Um, I have a question from Kelvin. Um, what should a company expect of their employees? Jeff, you want to take that one first? Well, I think you should expect a learning curve for the employee and the you know the manager or the supervisor or the you know whoever's overseeing and depending on how big your organization is but brass tacks they got to deliver and there may be things that get in the way and make it difficult but that can only go so far um you know this is going to be trying times and who knows how long this is going to last um and who knows whether the 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 sort of quarantine and so not you know and social distancing and the, the physical distancing that we're going to be going through how long this is going to last um in as much as i've said you know telework has to be voluntary or ideally telework would should have been voluntary that's give them a, a week to get settled in and then say you got to make it work uh because everyone this is an all-hand situation for the company if you are a believer in your organization as an employee if you have that that I've always said that that successful people, successful workers are either entrepreneurs or they think like an entrepreneur. So whether you have buy-in to your company or not, that's what's gonna de determine how you succeed in this, in this virtual workspace, in this home-based workspace. So it's not unreasonable for the, for the employee to take or need a little bit of transition time, but that's what this week was. That's what maybe the first part of next week is. Um, if the if the employer is making every opportunity available and saying, you know, come get your chair, might throw you a little stipend to go to your local office supply store or a, you know, wherever to, to get a desk and, and get something that you can work on so you're not at the kitchen table. You know, there's expectations um, on both sides. But I'd, I'd say this time next week, we better be cooking with gas because you either jump in or fall off. And that's, you know, those are your two options, make it work or find some other place to work. Yeah, yeah, I agree. As an employ employer, you know, we certainly understand that this week is about creating the new normal and, and getting it up to speed. Uh, but I think, you know, going forward, we're probably going to need some um, some guidelines, you know, uh, maybe updating employee handbooks, things like that. Um, and and or, you know, creating some expectations for um, for folks we we, we had a meeting this morning and a couple of people didn't show up. So, you know, there's really no excuse for, um, you know, not being on the digital meetings uh, when, especially our teams, we're very familiar with that. So right. uh, we're definitely going to have to get used to a new normal, but then uh, we probably have to get back to work because most businesses just can't take a month off. It's um, going to be, it's going to be harmful enough yeah. without people. It, it Look, it's going to be a struggle. And for some people, it's going to feel impossible. But we're we're gonna have a hard time for a little while here, and so you know this is your transition period. Let's get through it, and you know in a month, two months, I'm not getting it with telework is not gonna cut it. You're gonna have to make it make it fly, and you know work, collaborate, socialize with others, sort of commiserate it if you must, 
talk to experts, read content. There's a lot of content out there on how to work from home. There are a lot of groups out there on social media, and there'll be a lot more now with, with more people doing it. You know, just look for help, look for guidance, look for advice, and see how you can make it work and know that you're not alone. Here's a good question from Charles Ferdon. Thanks, Charles. Um, do either of you recommend a good client management software to keep everyone on the same page and control file flow, workflow, and sh work sharing? Um, so we use a tool called Acelo. We use another one called Asana, A-C-C-E-L-O, Acelo, A-S-A-N-A, -A -A, Asana. Um, both of them are for you know, project management, workflow, file storage, uh, work assignment. So we assign uh, tasks to all of our team members. And then um, we use salesforce.com. Salesforce.com is the big 800 pound gorilla for our sales CRM. Um, and that's basically managing um, our sales leads and um, sales follow up sales proposals. And then um, once we activate a client, we go into a cello and a sauna. Uh, Jeff, what, what do you think in terms of CRM? Um, I don't I don't have a lot of needs for it, but I mean I'm I'm really a, a, a Google Docs and you know the Google uh, environment guy. So all my work is really done through the Google platform. So um, Google Drive, you know, with with Docs, with Sheets. If I'm creating a PowerPoint, if I'm working with other clients, sharing documents, things like that, I don't have a heavy need for CRM. Um, I used to use Outlook, but it got bloated, and uh, so I'm now on Google Contacts. And while it's not as robust as I would like, it serves my needs. And also, as a micro enterprise, um, you know, a party of one in the way I work, um, it works well, and I'm able to get other people involved in it as well. And then, uh, so it's 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 worked well for for my needs. So, if anybody wants to ask a question, um, I can try and unmute, uh, and we're happy to take some voice questions. Uh, we've got a couple of folks brave enough to be on camera. Hey, Carol, Michael. Any other questions? I use ACT as my CRM. I've been using it for years. Works great. Also, yeah. uh, Zoho. I used to work for a company that had Zoho that everything was in here. That reminds me, I used to use ACT way back when um, and it was great. I, you're right, Michael. I mean, I really enjoyed using it. Um, it was robust. Um, it, it really worked well. And, and I'm sure it's even better. I, I'm not sure. I, I presume it's um, cloud-based in the application, how, how you, you use it. I don't know if it's local or if it's cloud-based or uh, sort of both. Um, oh. Both. So, you know, I remember using it and I really enjoyed its, its functionality. Great. Well, if there's no other questions, oh, Henry. Hey, Henry. Hey, guys, listen, first off, a great webinar, a lot of great information for a lot of people that haven't been working from home. Um, you know, I, from when I work remote a lot, sometimes I just go to the office about once a week, but this is really good. Um, another good, it's, I use it like a CRM as well, and I can also do a lot of marketing emails and stuff from it, and it's free, and you can send up to 2,000 emails at a time is um i mean a month is um hubspot hubspot is really good it also has some templates where you can go in there create your nice little designs upload it send it out and and it's really no big deal there's no limit and i've been using it now probably for about two years now for free and it keeps track of how many people opened up your emails um if they clicked on a link if they forwarded all that it's called hubspot it's really good yeah we love hubspot That's another one it's awesome Great. Yeah. Well, um, we just got over an hour, so uh, thank you all so much, and thank you for being here. We will uh, we'll send an, everyone a copy of the recording, and um, you know we'll keep it going online. And um, you know, please connect with me, and, and I assume Jeff, you, you're open to connecting with folks on social media, and we can um, you know, conversation going and, and get through this tough time. Yep, absolutely. I appreciate your having me, and good luck to everybody. Make it work, and. Uh, you know, this, this too shall pass, but hopefully telework will stay with us. Thanks, Jeff, Absolutely. so much. All right, thank you. Being here. Thanks, Jay. Peace, y'all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.